In this unit, we'll talk about some special derivatives. And we'll start by looking at implicit differentiation. And under that topic, the first thing we'll look at is what functions defined implicitly are. All of the functions we've seen before come in the form that we can write at y equals f of x. Now what this does here when we write it this way, it defines the function y explicitly as a function of x. So that is the way we usually see functions. You usually see y equals some formula here representing the function. Now sometimes functions don't come in this nice form. So we can ask the following question. What if y is not written in this way? Say in terms of, to put it another way, in terms of x. The next question one might ask if that happens, is y still, well it's not explicitly a function of x, but maybe it's implicitly a function of x. So is y implicitly a function of x? The answer to that in full generality actually is a hard question. We won't have to answer it that specifically, but we will ask what we can do to find out some representation of the function if it's only implicitly given. But before we do that, let's look at an example. Let us consider the unit circle, which you know is a perfectly well-defined curve. It's the unit circle after all. But as a function, we'd have to solve this for y. And if we do solve this for y, notice that we get two functions out of this. We either get the square root of 1 minus x squared, or we get minus, or negative, the square root of 1 minus x squared. So what we found out here is that there are two functions that are implicit in this original equation with two variables, x squared plus y squared equals 1. So two functions are lurking in there, and we have pulled them out by writing them this way by solving for y. Now we were lucky enough to be able to solve for y in this, but generally we can't do that. Just to make this a little clearer, let's look at the graphs of all three of these. The original curve, which you know is the unit circle, which I can just draw like this, crossing through one here and one here. And let's draw the other two so we can compare. This one is the upper semicircle, so it just looks like this, crossing here at one, one and minus one. And this one, of course, is the lower semicircle, going from minus one to one and down here to minus one. So these two functions seem to have graphs which are part of the original full plane curve. And that's what often will happen, is when you find two functions or one function implicit in another, that the graphs will be some limited version of the original graph. But even so, this still doesn't answer the question, what happens if you cannot solve for y, which is more common. So let's write out a note about that. Sometimes, solving for y in terms of x, that would be getting y explicitly in terms of x, so that kind of solution is either difficult or even impossible, mathematically impossible. So let me give you two examples here so you can see what I'm talking about. The first one is x cubed plus y cubed equals 3xy. Now this, in terms of y, is a cubic in y. If you just think of the x as part of the coefficients, then you just have a cubic polynomial in y. And yes, you could solve for y if you knew the formulas for cubics. So this would fall under the category of difficult, but possible. Here is an example, however, of something very simple that is impossible. Suppose you have sine of xy equal to y. This one is impossible. There is no way for you to solve for y in terms of x out of this expression. You can approximate y if you knew what x was, but that's not the same thing as getting a solution for this. So, those are two things that can happen, and we've already moved away from the x squared equal y squared case, where we were able to solve for y, to two cases where one's difficult and one's impossible. Here's something else that can happen. Also, 
Uh, sometimes you can write down an equation and it has no meaning. And let me give you an example of that. Suppose I write down x squared plus y squared equals minus 1. Now this is a perfectly good equation and you might look at it and say, well, I can go ahead and solve that for y. But before you do that, stop for a moment and ask yourself, are there any x and y values that make this true? The answer is no. If you take any real numbers, x and y, and you square them and add them, the lowest number you could get would be zero. You can't get negative numbers. So there's no way that this left-hand side can equal minus one, which means this has no meaning. And no matter what manipulations you do on it, it's still not going to have any meaning. So let us see if we can pull together some of these notes here and ask a further question. If an equation that you're given in x and y, two variables, does have meaning, okay, so we will assume that it has meaning, and let us also assume that y is implicitly a function of x. If that happens, can we, especially if it's implicitly a function of x, but it's difficult or impossible to solve for y, can we learn something about y? And something about y for us is going to mean, in particular, say, does y have does y have a derivative? That will be one of our largest questions. And so we will start addressing that question in our next. Let's now pursue that question we posed earlier, which was, can we find the derivative of an implicitly defined function? So that process will be called implicit differentiation and we'll be looking now for derivatives of functions defined implicitly. So let me write that down also so we have it just so you can look at it here. This is also called implicit differentiation. And that's using just two words to say this. Now, the idea here is that if you have an equation in which a function y is implicitly defined and you want to find its derivative with respect to x. The idea is simply differentiate, just differentiate the equation that you are given as it stands. You don't have to do anything to it. You don't have to solve it for y in terms of x. Just differentiate it as it stands. Don't even try. to first solve for y in terms of x. Now this makes things a lot easier on you. You're not going to solve for y in terms of x at all. Here in doing this, the chain rule in particular will become very handy. But you will use all the other rules, the product rule, the quotient rule, and so on. So you want to keep all of those in mind. All right, let's begin by doing an example. Let's find dy dx for x squared plus y squared equals 1. That's that unit circle we've already looked at several times. So just a quick picture here in the corner so we can keep in mind what we're talking about. What we want to do is find the derivative here of y with respect to x, but I do not want to first write y explicitly as a function of x, although I can do that here. I want to avoid that process and just see how this implicit differentiation technique works. So I begin with x squared plus y squared equals 1 here. And as I said, I simply differentiate both sides as they stand. So I put d dx on the left of x squared plus y squared and d dx of 1 on the right. And this really is the best notation for this. It keeps things very clear. And remember, we're differentiating with respect to x. So we're thinking of y here as a function of x. That's one thing you want to keep in mind here. Y is being thought of as a function of x. 
So we have the derivative set up. Let's go ahead and do it. The derivative of x squared is 2x. That's easy. Now the derivative of y squared, remember that y is an unknown function of x. We must treat this using the chain rule. So the derivative here is going to be 2 times y, of course, that's the outer part, times the derivative of y, the inner part. So that's 2y dy dx. And on the right, the derivative of a constant, of course, is 0. Now, let me go ahead and make clear what we've done here. In the process, we've used the chain rule. This will happen again and again in these sorts of problems. The chain rule is needed for doing this derivative with respect to x of y squared because, as I wrote above, y is actually a function of x. So we want to keep that in mind while we're working this. Now, from here, I am looking for dy dx after all, so now it's a matter of algebra. The calculus is done. We simply solve for dy dx. In doing that, we get dy dx. I put the 2x on the other side, divide by the 2y, so I will end up with minus x over y. And this will be, of course, where y, the denominator, is not 0. And there is the rule for finding the slopes of tangent lines to this curve, the derivative, in other words. And you can see that it makes sense. If we look at the circle here, the only place where there would be no derivative would be these points here at the x-axis, because those would be vertical tangents, and those would not exist. Well, those are exactly where y would be 0. So this formula seems to be the right formula for this. But the important thing is we got this. And you might notice here that unlike derivatives we've seen in the past, this one involves both x and y. Not only is x in there, which you expect from a derivative, but also y is in there. And there's no way to avoid that. If you want to get these derivatives, this is the technique that you use. And this technique will often lead us to expressions that involve both x and y. Let's see how that works in this second example. Again, the problem is find dy dx. And here's the equation. 2y equals x squared plus the sine of y. And this time, it is definitely impossible to get the y out of this. So we want to simply find the derivative using our implicit differentiation technique because we haven't got any other way to do it. Solution. All right. So we want to take the derivative of both sides. So the derivative on the left of 2y. And on the right, the derivative of the entire side, x squared plus the sine of y. Now, on the left-hand side, y, remember, is a function of x, as it has always been. So this will be 2 times the derivative of that unknown function, which we don't know, so we just write dy dx. Here, the derivative of x squared with respect to x is 2x. Plus, now sine is operating upon another function, which we don't know. So this is definitely where the chain rule comes in. So I have the sine of a function, so the derivative of sine of something is cosine of that something, so that comes back, times the derivative of the inside, which is y, and that's going to be dy dx. So if you're remembering from the chain rule, this is the outer function, in this case, the derivative of the outer function, and this is the derivative of the inner function. And together, that makes the chain rule. So continuing from this, again, we've reached the stage where this is simply algebra. We solve for dy dx. So I'm going to pull the dy dx's all over to the left-hand side and factor them out. So that'll be dy dx. There's a 2 there. And this comes over. It'll be minus cosine of y equaling 2x, which is remaining on the right-hand side. And then I just divide to get dy dx, which is what I'm looking for. Over, so I get 2x over 2 minus cosine of y. This is the derivative I was looking for. And notice again that this involves both x and y. So this is typical of what happens when you find a derivative using implicit differentiation. x and y will be involved here. So keep that in mind. With this technique of implicit differentiation, we can now find the derivatives of the rational powers of x. This is something we talked about before, but now we can actually derive this correctly. Consider the following function, x to the m over n power. 
where m and n are integers, of course, and n is not zero. Now this is a rational power of x. We've talked about this before, and now we're able to actually compute the derivative of this. We will, now this is just a technical note, we assume a derivative exists. All right, let's do a little development here. And we're going to use implicit differentiation along the way. Let's write the following down. Write y, instead of f of x, y equals x to the m over n. And there is the function we're beginning with. If I can write my n correctly here. y equals m over n. We cannot find the derivative of this directly because we don't have a rule yet. What we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this so that we'll be able to use implicit differentiation. If we raise both sides, and I'll write it out for you, raise both sides to the power, well, we want to get rid of the denominator here to the power n, what do we end up with? We end up with y to the n equals x to the m. This is now an equation in x and y that is attackable by implicit differentiation because that's exactly what we looked at before. So let's go to this next page and look at that. y to the n equals x to the m. Then by implicit differentiation, we'll take the derivative of both sides just as it stands. So that's d dx of y to the n equals d dx of x to the m. And this is the implicit differentiation step. Now when we take the derivative of y to the n, because y is an unknown function of x, what we'll write down is n y to the n minus 1, that's the outer function, times the derivative of the inner function, which is y, and that's dy dx. On the right-hand side, we just have a power of x, so the previous rule we have, the power rule works, m times x to the m minus 1. Now again, we've reached the stage where it's just algebra. Solve for dy dx. So let's do that. dy dx is equal to, let's see, I bring the n underneath here, I'll have m over n, and then I'll have x to the m minus 1 over y to the n minus 1. But y was originally written in a form something like this, so we should be able to simplify things considerably here. Remember that y to the n minus 1 is really, here's the original definition of y, x to the m over n, to the n minus 1. So I've just replaced y by x to the m over n, which is what it was to begin with. Now I simplify. m over n times n gives me x to the m, and then m over n times minus 1 is minus m over n. So now I can put that back in here, and I'll have m over n, x to the m minus 1, over x to the m minus m over n. And if I simplify this, finally, I'll have m over n, and then x to the m minus 1, we subtract, so subtract m, that's going to knock that m out. And then subtracting this will make it positive, so this will be x to the m over n minus 1. That should be something that looks very familiar. And we'll write this now in the form of a rule, and you'll see that it is. It's exactly the way the power rule ought to be, based on our experience. d dx of x to the m over n should be... You take the power down, m over n, times x to the power minus 1. And that's exactly what we just learned by our development on the previous page. And remember, implicit differentiation was essential for that development. So this is the familiar power rule, which is great. We don't have to learn a new rule. Now, likewise, the usual extension here, if we have a function u, which is a function of x, we can rewrite this rule as the derivative of u to the m over n. And then using the chain rule, this is m over n, u to the m over n minus 1 times du dx. And so that's just the standard generalization to an arbitrary function. In fact, we will do an example of such a thing on this next page. But it's really nice that the same power rule continues to work for rational powers. And we will soon see that it also works for irrational powers, too. Let's find the derivative now of 
x squared minus x plus 2 to the 3 fourths power. With what we know now, we can think of this as a function like the u was on the previous page, taken to the power at 3, 3 fourths. And so the chain rule says you do the outside first, so it's 3 fourths, leave the inside untouched for now, and then the power is 3 fourths minus 1, times now the derivative of the inside, which is easy, that's 2x minus 1, and we're done. We can simplify this to a minus 1 fourth if we like, and rewrite this a little bit by writing x squared minus x plus 2 to the minus 1 fourth times 2x minus 1. But that's just a matter of taste at that point. Time for some exercises. For the first one, let's practice this implicit differentiation by finding dy dx, where x squared y plus 3xy cubed is equal to x plus 3. Go ahead and give that one a try. Let's see how this works out as an answer. Well, I want to take the derivative of this using implicit differentiation, so I simply differentiate both sides as they stand. So I rewrite this, and this kind of practice is really useful, so keep this up as you get more and more experienced. So I take the derivative with both sides using the d bar dx notation. Now I notice as I'm going along, here I have a product, here I have a product, here the y is just y, here it's taken to the cubic power, so I'm going to have to deal with that. So I'm keeping in mind the product rule and probably the chain rule will come into play here. Let's start. Let's take the derivative starting at the left. Well, the first thing I see is that x squared times y is a product. So the product rule says leave one of them alone, say x squared, times the derivative of y, well that's just dy dx, plus now the y left alone times the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. So there's the product rule applied to this first expression. Plus, now when I do things with an expression that has a constant out front, I like to just leave the constant out front and deal with the rest of it without that constant in my way. Now this is a product, so again I'll use the product rule, x times the derivative of y cubed. Now the derivative of y cubed will involve the chain rule, so I even jot that down here to remember. And I will have 3y to the 2 power times the derivative of y, which is dy dx. That's half of the product rule. I need the other half now, which is to leave y cubed alone times the derivative of x, which is 1. On the right-hand side of the equal sign, the derivative is much easier. Here I get 1, and here I get 0. So this is just 1 plus 0. Once again, at this stage of the game, you have nothing to do but algebra. The calculus was done in this first step. This is now algebra where we need to solve for dy dx. So to practice that, let's bring all the dy dx's over to the left-hand side and factor out their uh, coefficients. Here, dy dx has x squared over as a coefficient. Let's see here. This dy dx has 3 times x times 3 times y squared. That will be 9xy squared multiplied by dy dx. That will equal everything on the right-hand side. 1 is already there. Let's see. This y2x, which I can write as minus 2xy, will be moved to the right. And then from within this expression, we have 3y cubed, which needs to move over as minus 3y cubed. And then this just needs to come underneath, and we end up with dy dx is 1 minus 2xy minus 3y cubed over x squared plus 9xy squared. And there you have it. You have found the derivative of this function using implicit differentiation here. Let's look at a second example or exercise for you here. Find dy dx again. This one's a little different, but involves the same principles. Cosine of x times y squared is equal to y. So try that one. For this problem, we apply the same technique. As a solution, I will take the derivative and write it out using the notation d dx of the left hand side equal to the derivative of the right hand side. Now on the left the chain rule immediately comes into play. This is cosine of another function and that inner function itself will involve a rule that will involve the product rule. 
So to apply the chain rule, I look at this and say the outer function's cosine. What is the derivative of cosine of something that is minus the sine of that something? So this derivative begins minus the sine of xy squared untouched. Now the derivative of the inside, which is a product, involves the product rule. So it's x times the derivative of y squared. Again, the chain rule comes into play. It's 2y to the 1 power times dy dx, because y is the function inside. That's half the product rule. The other half is to leave y squared alone times the derivative of x, which is 1. And on the right-hand side, this is the derivative of y with respect to x, which we write dy dx. Again, we have done the calculus in this first step. We found the derivatives. Now we just need to solve for dy dx. Again, I will pull these dy dx's over to the left and push everything else over to the right. So dy dx, let's see what we have here. We have a lot multiplied by dy dx here. We have minus sine xy squared times x times 2y. So let's put that in a better order. Minus 2xy times sine xy squared. There's a dy dx on the other side which we want to bring over. So that'll be over with the coefficient of 1, minus 1. And then y squared in here times the minus sine xy squared moves to the right. So that's y squared sine of xy squared. And finally, we bring this underneath, and we end up with all this algebra, dy dx, y squared sine of xy squared, all over minus 2xy sine of xy squared minus 1. And once again, we have found this derivative from this expression where we could not solve for y directly or explicitly by using implicit differentiation. And in all these problems, once you get the first step done with the chain rule, the product rule, and so on applied, the rest is algebra. So be sure and practice your algebra to get these right. As we continue looking at special derivatives, now we'll look at derivatives involving logarithms. And we'll start by looking at derivatives of logarithmic functions. We will find here dy dx of the natural log of x. That is the most important logarithmic function for us. And whenever you have other logarithmic functions, I've already advised you to turn those into natural log of x problems. Now, natural log of x, of course, is defined only for x greater than 0. So let me remind you of that, that the, this is the domain of the natural log of x. All right. Before I can get to the actual derivation of the derivative here, I need to remind you of a couple of things from your past experience with logs. The first one is to recall that the log function is continuous. So it's a function that has no breaks, and we discussed this previously. Specifically, so at any point A, we have the following. Now, this is going to be how we use it here. We may not have stated it exactly this way before, so it's good to rewrite this. So at any point A, we have the following. The natural log of A can be written as the limit of the natural log of, of some variable, say u, it doesn't matter, as u approaches A. This is exactly the definition of continuity. We usually write it in the reverse direction, that a function's continuous at the point A if the limit of the function as u approaches a equals the function at a. So this is the definition of continuity. The way we will use this now is to say, observe that this is the same thing as saying the natural log of the limit of u as u approaches a. This is trivial because if u is approaching a, then u is approaching a. So this is just a. So it's the same as log a here. But notice what has happened in these two expressions. What has happened is that the limit and the log have simply switched pace places. So we can think of this as the limit can be said to move through the function. And this works for all continuous functions, but in this case, it's the log that we're interested in. So it moves through the ln function. So let me box this in, because this is important for what we're going to do. Okay, so the limit and the log can be exchanged legally because of the continuity of the log function. Now here's a second recall, and this one's about a limit also, but not about continuity. You may remember this limit, 
that the limit as x goes either to plus infinity or minus infinity, either direction, of this expression, 1 plus 1 over x to the x power, turns out to be that nice base e that we've talked about. This number here comes as a result of this limit. Now we want to modify this for our use here today. So let's let u equal 1 over x. So I will replace 1 over x by u and see what happens here. So under those circumstances, x going to positive infinity means that u goes to what? Well, if this goes to infinity, that makes the expression go to 0. And if it's positive infinity, this will approach 0 from above. And x going likewise to negative infinity will mean that u is approaching 0 again, but this time from below. And the two of them together, of course, approach 0 from both sides, and that's a two-sided limit. Thus, by this rewriting, we can rewrite the limit as the limit as u goes to 0 of 1 plus, I'm replacing 1 over x by u, and then x gets replaced, of course, by 1 over u, and this limit is still equal to e. All this was was a change of variable, but it's a change of variable that we will be using in our next argument. So this is a change of variable. And remind you again that this is a two-sided limit. That's why I had to talk about the two directions here. So with this limit and the previous remark about continuity, we are ready to find the derivative of the natural log. So the derivative of the natural log function. Well, since we don't know anything about this, we go back to the basic definition. This is the limit as h goes to 0 of the natural log of x plus h minus the natural log of x, all over h. Well, we can simplify that with a little algebra and properties of logs. The first thing is 1 over h. We can pull out front, as I always do. And then this is a difference of logs. And you remember the log rules, rules that said a difference of logs is the log of the quotient of the two items here. So this would be the natural log of x plus h over x. That can algebraically be simplified a little further. This is the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h. Natural log of 1, x over x is 1, plus h over x. Then in the next step, let us do another change of variable. In this case, let's let v say equal h over x. So what does that mean as far as the limit goes? Well, v and h are both on top. So that means that v going to 0 two-sided, is exactly the same thing as saying that h goes to 0, again two-sided. So I can replace h going to 0 by v going to 0 in this next step, which is what I'm going to do. The limit is v goes to 0 of 1 over, well, let's see, if v equals hx, that means that h is going to be vx, so that's vx here, times the natural log of 1 plus v, and that limit is the limit we're looking for. But now it's beginning to recognize, you should be able to recognize this as a form we just talked about in our recollection. Let's see here, v goes to zero, the x is not involved, so let's pull that out of the way, out front. And then we have here the limit as v goes to zero of the natural log of one plus v. To the one over v power, which I can write because this 1 over v times the log, there's another log rule, which you may recall, uh, and we usually write it this way, that the log of something to a power, the power comes down out front, we're just using it in the reverse direction. So I have 1 over v power here. And I'll rewrite that on the next page so it looks a little better. But now we're going to use that property that says I can switch the log and the limit, and that will take me to my next stage. I have next 1 over x. Now I switch the log and the limit, so the log is now on the outside. The limit is on the inside of v going to 0. And what I have here is 1 plus v to the 1 over v power. But this limit, we just saw, is equal to e. So this now becomes 1 over x log of e. But e is exactly the number that makes the natural log equal to 1. So this is equal to 1. So in other words, I am done with 1 over x. So to pull this all together, what I have just found out is that if I take the derivative 
of the natural log of x, which is a function that is not a polynomial, it's not an algebraic function of any kind, this function has as its derivative the simple rational function 1 over x. Now that's really wonderful. And of course this holds only for x greater than 0 because that's the only place the log is defined. So there we have our derivative for the log function. And of course, just to write it in the same place, if we have the natural log of some function u, which is a function of x, then we simply flip it over, 1 over u, times the derivative of u because of the chain rule. And this always assumes that this function u of x is greater than 0 in the vicinity we're interested in. So this would be the generalized version of this very nice rule. So let's see if we can apply this rule. Let's take a couple of examples here. The first example will be natural log of x squared plus 1, and we want to find its derivative. Now just note for a moment, although it doesn't matter here, that x squared plus 1, because these are numbers that are added together, the natural log, there's no rule that would allow us to separate this. So I might write here, no log rules apply. So, that's just a note, let's continue onward. How would I take this derivative? Well, this is log of some function of x. So the rule says you just write 1 over whatever that function of x is, times the derivative of that function, which happens to be 2x here. And that's it, you're done. Let's take one that's a bit more interesting. Take the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of x squared times sine of x all over the square root of 1 plus x. Now, in this one, the right way to do this is not to try and do this directly, but use the power of the log to simplify this expression. You have those log rules that break up products, quotients, and bring powers down, and you should use those rules here. So the advice here is to use the log rules first before differentiating. I'll just abbreviate differentiating that way. So if I do that before I take the derivative, so the ddx is still here, I'm not taking the derivative yet. I run the log through here and use all the rules. So this is a log of a quotient, so it's the log of the top minus the log of the bottom. The log of the top is a product, so it's the log of the first plus the log of the second. The first has a power, that will come out, and this bottom one over here has a power, and that will come out. If you put this all together, you end up with 2 log x, this is good to practice, plus the log of sine x, minus, because it's on the bottom, and then the power 1 half comes out, log of 1 plus x. So there you have broken it down using the log rules, and you'll see now that the derivative is much easier to take. The derivative of 2 log x is going to be 2 times 1 over x, plus the log of sine x, you do 1 over sine x, the log always just flips it over, times the derivative of what's inside, and what's inside here is the derivative of sine x is cosine x, minus 1 half, times again the derivative of log of 1 plus x is 1 over 1 plus x, times the derivative of the inside, which is 1. And again, we're done. That's all there is to applying this rule. Well, one more thing before we leave this rule, which we will use a lot in this course, is to note something about a particular, slightly generalized version of the log function. Our original log function was the log of x, just like this. However, remember it's only defined for x positive. To generalize the function a little bit to a larger domain, if we put absolute value of x here, this allows us to say that this works for all x's that are not zero. The log is still not defined at zero, but now it is defined for negative numbers because the absolute value is in here. This picture that this function will have will be something like this. Here's the original log function passing through one, which is where the x's are positive. The x's are negative, and then hit with the absolute value is gonna give us exactly this picture from minus one going off to the left, symmetric, across the y-axis here. And this should be expected because the log of x and the log of minus x give you the same thing, which means that this would become an even function, as you may recall. 
So with that in mind, let us see what the derivative of this function would look like. The derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of x would be, well, it's going to depend on what x is, so we need two cases. It is, first of all, the derivative of just plain log of x for x greater than 0. On the other hand, it's the derivative of the log of minus x for x less than 0. Because when x is less than 0, the absolute value is minus x. Well, the first derivative here is easy. <coughs> That's 1 over x for x greater than 0. The second one, the same principle applies, except we have a minus x. So we'll have 1 over minus x times the derivative of minus x, which is minus 1, which turns out to be 1 over x. And that's true for x less than 0. So what have we discovered here? We've discovered that the derivative is 1 over x, no matter where x lives, as long as x is not 0. So this is just 1 over x for x not equal to 0. So we found out that the derivative of this extended function is exactly the same as the derivative of the original log function, which is very handy. Let's write that down here so we don't forget. The derivative of the log of the absolute value of x is 1 over x as long as x is not equal to 0. And this is going to be handy for our later work. We just looked at derivatives of the logarithmic functions. Now. There's a way to use logarithms to help you find derivatives of other functions that don't have logarithms in them. This is a nice little technique that we'll just take a moment to introduce. It's called the logarithmic differentiation technique. And here is the idea of this. What it, you do with the natural log is you prepare a function using it before you attempt a derivative. So before attempting a derivative. And it's a handy technique, but you have to remember to think to use it because there's no logarithm in the problem in question. For example, let me show you this. If y is equal to x squared times the cube root of 7x minus 14 all over 1 plus x cubed to the fourth power. And someone says to you, find the derivative of this function. Well, it's fairly complicated. It has a cube root in it. It has all these various powers. One way to attack this, if you know about the logarithm, is to hit both sides of this with the log and let the log break it up into parts, then take the derivative and solve for the dy dx that you're interested in. This can save you a lot of trouble. Let's go ahead and try this here. So first, before we even do anything involving the derivative, we'll do the preparation that I said. We'll go ahead and hit both sides with the natural log. Now on the left, of course, we just get natural log of y. On the right, you have to remember your natural log rules here. The natural log rules say, if you have a product, the log of the product is the sum of the logs. If you have something to a power, and this of course is to the one-third power, you have the power coming out front. There's no way to break up this difference, so we'll have to just leave that. However, down here, if you have something over something, if you have a log of a quotient, then it is the log of the top minus the log of the bottom, and so on. So if you put all those rules together from your past, here's what you'd end up with. 2 natural log of x, that's the x squared here, and then this multiplied, so it's going to be added to 1 third, that's that power coming down out front, of the natural log of 7x minus 14. Now the bottom part, minus because it's on the bottom, 4 because the power comes down, and natural log of 1 plus x cubed. Now there's nothing we can do about this difference or this sum because the log of those, is, the log does not affect those the way it does products and quotients. So with this done, now we'll go ahead and differentiate. And the differentiation will be easier than it might have been. So we just differentiate, and of course, this is implicit differentiation because we're just differentiating both sides as they stand. So the derivative of the left will be d dx of log y. On the right, I'll just go ahead and write it out. The derivative of 2 log x plus 1 third log of 7x minus 14 minus 4 log of 1 plus x cubed. Now on the left, the derivative is 1 over y, 
dy dx. Because it's a chain rule, we have to take the derivative of the inside, which is y. The right-hand side, we have a 2 here, which remains. The derivative of log x with respect to x is 1 over x, plus the 1 third, which remains. And then the derivative of the log of some complicated function is always 1 over that function times the derivative of that function. So that's 1 over 7x minus 14 times the derivative of 7x minus 14, which is just 7, minus the 4, which stays out front. And the same process here, it's 1 over 1 plus x cubed times the derivative of x cubed, which is 3x squared. Now, at this point, the derivative is done. The calculus part of this problem is done. To solve the problem, however, you want to find the derivative of the original function, so we need to solve for dy dx here. And that's what we'll do next. And luckily, it's not hard. There's only one dy dx here. We're going to move the y, of course, to the other side. And when we do that, we'll replace it by what it is in terms of x. Remember, we started out with y being that large function of x. Now we can replace that. So I'll put that here first. This is what y was, remember, x squared, the cube root of 7x minus 14, all over 1 plus x cubed to the fourth power. Now that's the y that is multiplied by this entire side. And then the rest of this, you just simplify up a bit. 2 over x plus, let's see, 7 over 3 times 7x minus 14, minus 12x squared here on the top, 1 plus x cubed on the bottom. And that's it. You are now done with this derivative. The advantage, again, is that in a function that you want to find the derivative for that has no logarithms, if it is a combination of products, powers, quotients, then very often the log can be used as a tool before taking the derivative to break up the function. And then taking the derivative with the log ends up with this derivative being found much more quickly than it might have been done directly. That's it. We wrap up by looking at the derivatives of irrational powers of x. This is something we left behind previously, and now we want to pick this up so that we have a rule. So let r be any real number. So unlike previous cases where we looked at powers of x, where we had the powers being integers or fractions, now we can let r be even something like square root of 2 or pi, actual irrational numbers, because what we're going to find out here is a rule for taking the derivative of x to the r. That's what we're interested in here. So how are we going to go about doing this? Well, here is the development. And this will use both the implicit differentiation we've been talking about and the natural log function. First, we'll write y equals x to the r, so we can name the function y. Then what we'll do is we'll imagine that these are both positive numbers and take the natural log of y, absolute value to make it positive, and the natural log then of x to the r on the right-hand side. The natural log on the right-hand side, since this is x to the r and that power comes out, it comes all the way out front, and this is r times natural log of the absolute value of x. Now, that's the preparatory work. Now we finally take the derivative and see what happens. This is implicit differentiation again. So we take the log of the left, the derivative that is of the left-hand side, and we take the derivative of the right-hand side and see what happens. Now the derivative on the left, we've already done this previously. The derivative of the log of the absolute value of y is the same thing as the derivative of the log of just y. So this is 1 over y, of course, and then dy dx. On the right, remember, r is a constant, so it just stays out front. Then the derivative of the log is the same thing we just did here, except it's just 1 over x. So that means we're closer to what we want. What we'll do now is take this y and put it on top on this side, and then we'll replace the y in both places, and we'll be done. 
So the dy dx from the previous page is equal to r, and here's that y I mentioned, y over x. And therefore, if we replace y by x to the r, which is what it is after all, well, look what we have. We have the derivative of x to the r equals r times, let's see, x to the r on the top over x gives me x to the r minus 1. Now, if you think about this for just a second, you realize this is exactly the same power rule you've seen all along. And in fact, we can now call this the general power rule. No matter what real number r is, if you take the derivative of x to the r, it's always r times x to the r minus 1. It doesn't matter if r is irrational or any other kind of number. So r is any real number now. So now we can just set that to rest and know that we can always take those derivatives. So for example, you can do something like this. If you want to take the derivative of x to the square root of 2 power, that's going to be square root of 2 times x to the square root of 2 minus 1. So there's no fear there. It is just the usual for some exercises. First of all, we've learned a lot about taking special derivatives in this section, so let's go ahead and practice a couple of those. Find dy dx. Here is the function. y equals the natural log of the natural log of the natural log of x. Why don't you give that one a try? I hope you weren't too confused by seeing three logs there. If we peel this apart using the chain rule, it really is not very difficult. It will use the properties of the derivative of the log, but it's not too hard to see what goes on. So if I want this derivative, I'm looking for the derivative of the natural log of the natural log of the natural log of x. And the key here is not to look too deep too soon. This is a function that is the natural log of something. Right now, I don't care what that something is. I could cover it up with my hand. It's the natural log of something. Now, the derivative of the natural log of something is always the same thing. It's 1 over that something, which happens to be the log of the log of x here, times the derivative of that something. So now we'd look at this inside. Now, it is the log of the log. Again, it's a log of something, so the derivative of this log is 1 over whatever's on the inside, so that's going to be 1 over the natural log of x. Then we go further inside and find the derivative of the natural log of x and have 1 over x. So this part here is, in the second step, the derivative of the natural log of the natural log of x. So I had this 1 over the function and the derivative of the function. And the same thing went on in here. I had 1 over the log x, this function, and then the derivative of log x. And that's it. This was just an application of the chain rule twice. And you'll see this happen in lots and lots of problems. So you want to keep your head straight about how you think about this. Let's look at another problem. Find the equation of the line tangent, we've done these kind of things before, of the line tangent to the graph of, and here's the function, f of x equals the natural log of the absolute value of x at a given point, at the point x naught equals minus 2. So I want to find the equation of the line tangent to the graph when x naught is equal to minus 2. Try that. As usual, when we're looking for the equation of a line, we ask ourselves what information is given to us and what could I find using the information that is given. Let me see here. I have a point. Actually, I have the x-coordinate of a point, so let's write that down. And then let's get the y-coordinate while I'm at it. So I have a point which will be of the form minus 2, that's the x naught part, and then what is the function? The log of the x, so this is going to be log of 2, and that will be the x naught y naught point, which lies on the graph of this tangent line. So we have a point. The next piece of information we'd like to get is the slope of the line, and that'll be sufficient to write down the equation of the line. The slope, as we know, is going to be gotten by using the derivative and using that as a formula to find the slope at this point. So I need to take this derivative. Well, Luckily, we've done this derivative before. The derivative f prime of x, or we can write it this way, is with the d bar dx notation, 
is the derivative of the log of absolute value of x. And that, we know, is just 1 over x. But we don't want the derivative in general. We want it at one specific point. So I'll use both notations so we can practice here. f prime at minus 2, that's what the x naught is, is the same thing as saying the derivative of the log of the absolute value of x with a bar here, where x naught is equal to minus 2. All of that amounts to this being minus 1 half. So the slope of the line is minus 1 half. The point is minus 2 log 2. And so we can go ahead and write down the equation of this. This is a tangent line now of this line. The standard format is y minus y naught equals m times x minus x naught. And now we just substitute in the pieces we know. y minus the log of 2 equals m. m is the slope. So that's minus 1 half x minus. And the x value, the x naught value, is minus 2. So minus or minus 2 will give me plus 2. And there you have it. There is the equation of this line. You can simplify this if you need to, but that's as far as we need to go today.